Before we begin, can I remind members, witnesses and those in the public area to make sure the mobile phones are completely turned off. Please, this is to interfere with the broadcasting system here. Uh, we are here today to discuss the report on the economic and, so and societal importance of the Irish sector beef sector to the country. I would like to welcome from the IFA Mr Joe Healy, President, Mr Angus Woods, IFA Livestock Chairman, Mr Kevin Kinsley, IFA Director of Livestock, Mr Damien MacDonald, Director General, and thank him for coming forward to me today to present the report on the economic and societal impact, importance of the Irish sector beef sector. Before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witness protected by absolute privilege and respect to the evidence you to give to the committee. However, you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the specific matter of these proceedings to be given. You are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to effect where possible. You should not criticise and make charge against any person or entity by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charge against either a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Mr. He, now I'll ask you to make your opening statement, please. Then we'll take questions from the members. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and Committee members, and thank you for inviting us in today to uh, address you on this very important sector. And you have already named the people that are here beside me, so there's no need to repeat. Um, and there are very severe challenges in our important livestock sector, especially our suckler cow sector. Low incomes, Brexit, beef prices below the cost of production, a lack of price competition, proposed cuts to the cap, increased beef imports, or imports from Mercosur, for example, and other trade deals. The latest Chagas data for 2018 shows an average farm income of only just over €10,000 for cattle rearing farms, down 19 per cent for 2018. This is not sustainable and we need a much stronger and more supportive government policy for the suckler cow sector. As part of the IFA campaign to secure additional targeted direct payments of €200 Euro per suckler cow, we retained the services of the eminent agricultural economist Professor Thea Hennessy, head of the Cork University Business School in UCC. Professor Hennessy and her team undertook a full assessment and overview of the suckler beef sector and produced a comprehensive report in August 2018 entitled The Economic and Societal Importance of the Irish Suckler Beef Sector. We launched the report at the Tullamore Show and presented a copy to Minister Creed. In addition, copies were sent to all members of the Oireachtas. The objectives of the report was to assess the importance of the suckler cow herd to Irish agriculture, the Irish beef sector and indeed the Irish economy to examine the economic and social impact of the suckler herd, especially in terms of people and employment, and also to explore environmental and policy issues related to the suckler cow herd. I understand committee members have been provided with a copy of Professor Hennessy's full report for today's hearing. This presentation provides a summary of the main findings and conclusions of the report. The beef sector in Ireland is very significant, accounting for over one-third of all agricultural output and over 20% of total Irish food and drink exports. The agri-food sector in general provides direct and indirect employment to over 300,000 people, with over 13,000 employed in the meat processing sector alone. The value of beef exports is growing and exceeded £2.6 billion in 2017. Domestic consumption of Irish beef accounted for a further 230 million. In all, the value of the Irish beef sector is estimated to be almost 2.9 billion euros. The large and valuable beef sector is supported by a suckler cow herd of approximately 1 million cows, according to CSO data, although recent reports based on Department of Agriculture a animal movement identification identification system put this figure closer to 900,000. The suckler cow herd is, is distributed throughout the country but particularly dominating my own part of the country in the west. The important regional presence of the suckler cow sector is reflected in the fact that suckler cows account for over 80% of all cows in the west with that figure in excess of 90% in some counties. Cattle farmers make considerable contribution to the Irish local economy, both through inputs they purchase and outputs produced. There are 77,000, almost 78,000 specialist cattle farms in Ireland. 
It's estimated that cattle farmers spend over one and a half billion euros annually on agri inputs, most of which is spent in the local rural economy. The economic impact of agriculture and beef in particular is considerable and exceeds that of many other sectors in the Irish economy, meaning that an increase in output in the beef sector generates relatively more economic activity than a comparable increase in other industrial sectors. Indeed, the multiplier effect for the beef sector is greater than that of the agricultural sector in general. That's to say that a €1 million Euro increase in beef in the beef sector output would generate a further 2.11 million in the wider economy and support an additional 16 jobs. The comparative figure for agriculture sector in general is 1.44 million. Direct payments made to farmers also make a substantial contribution to the wider rural economy as farmers use these payments to purchase inputs and to generate output that leads to further economic activity. Previous research has estimated that for every one euro of direct payments to cattle farmers, that it supports four euros 28 of output to the wider economy over four times. In addition to the economic impact, suckler farmers contribute to wider societal sustainability, particularly as they are often located in marginal or economically disadvantaged areas where their presence is vital to the social fabric and cultural capital. They produce public goods such as protection of the environment and biodiversity and the preservation of the landscape and unique features such, such as stone walls and hedgerows, all of which positively contribute to the image of rural Ireland and rural tourism. Previous research has shown that extensive grass-based farm systems such as suckler cow farming deliver higher levels of public goods. For a small island on the edge of Europe, Ireland punches above its weight when it comes to beef exports being the largest exporter of beef in the EU and sixth largest exporter of beef in the world. The National Suckler Herd is of, is of fundamental importance to Ireland's reputation as a major exporter of high quality prime beef. Cattle from, suck, from the Suckler Herd generally have a superior grading profile and heavier weight for age, resulting in higher saleable meat yield and higher value cuts. The prevalence of Irish-owned companies in the beef sector and the relatively low reliance of beef farming and meat processing on, import, on imported inputs means that beef exports make a major contribution to net foreign earnings in the Irish economy. It's estimated that every €100 Euros worth of exports from the bio sector, which includes beef, generates €48 Euros in net for, foreign earnings, while the non-bio sector contributes €19. Euros. Consumers worldwide are becoming increasingly concerned about the sustainability of food production. This provides a unique opportunity for Ireland as we produce some of the world's most sustainable beef. The carbon footprint of beef production in Ireland is well below the European average. It is the fifth lowest in Europe and is almost one quarter of the Brazilian footprint. The BDGP is delivering further carbon efficiencies with the ICBF estimating that by 2030, the genetic gain achieved through the program will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 14% per kilo of beef produced. <clears throat> there are many positives around the sustainable system of Irish beef production. The UN placed Ireland as the most water efficient producer of food globally with a 0.2% stress rating. Other international studies have shown that Ireland is the most nitrogen efficient producer of livestock products in Europe. Animal welfare in Ireland is extremely high by global standards. Growth pr uh, promoters and hormone treatments are forbidden and our clean green image is a major marketing strength internationally. Furthermore, grass fed beef has been proved to be healthier lower in fat with a content of two to six times more omega-3. It's lower in fat with a content of two to six times more omega-3 fatty acids and as such demands for grass-fed beef is growing, especially in affluent markets. All of these positives uh, attributes around the, our beef sector and our marketing and promotional campaigns are all built on the back of our quality suckler beef herd. The economic outlook is for continued growth in the global demand for beef, 
with the OECD FAO projecting that global consumption of beef will grow by 9% by 2026. The recent opening of the Japanese, Chinese and American markets for Irish beef is also a positive development, especially in light of the potential threats by Brexit. However, those markets must deliver for farmers and not just promise delivery. Notwithstanding the economic importance of the beef sector to the wider economy, to the wider Irish economy and its continued success on international export markets, the Irish industry is underpinned by a farm sector facing considerable economic difficulties. This income situation on cattle farms in Ireland remains a ch challenging, with the Chagas National Farm Survey showing an average farm income of just €12,500 on cattle rearing farms in 2017. On average, costs of production exceed market prices and the reliance on direct payments is critical. Without a substantial increase in beef prices and or improvements in efficiency levels, the vast majority of cattle farmers will continue to rely on direct payments. Furthermore, a number of threats loom on the horizon for the future of the Irish beef sector. Brexit and other international trade agreements, such as Mercosur, for example, threaten future trade patterns and ultimately farm level prices. The impending reform of the cap may also impact on the value of direct payments to farmers. The impact of climate change policy on the ability of the sector to exploit future market opportunities is a further threat as Ireland is committed to a number of international agreements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In the context of sustainable food production, however, international carbon leakage is a major concern. Carbon leakage occurs if Ireland reduces the production of beef to meet international policy commitments, but less carbon efficient countries increase beef production to satisfy growing international demand. The very difficult income situation on Irish suckler farms is unsustainable and is already resulting in individual farmers reducing animal numbers uh, leading to a loss in beef output, export values and employment. It's estimated that a 10% contraction in the suckler cow herd would lead to a loss in beef output of €145 million Euros and a loss in total output to the economy of over €300 million. Euros. A contraction in the Irish suckler cow herd may also lead to land abandonment in marginal areas, causing a loss of natural landscape features, biodiversity and contracting rural economy. The Irish suckler cow sector is at a critical juncture. A number of factors threaten its development and sustainability. Without positive action, it's most likely that, though, that these factors will lead to a contracting national suckler cow herd. This will have implications for the large farming community engaged in suckler farming, the vibrancy of rural areas, the agri-input sector, employment in the beef processing sector and the value of exports from, from Ireland. These negative implications will be most harshly felt in the west of Ireland and particularly in local economies and communities where there may be a limited alternative economic opportunities. I now wish to hand over to our Livestock Chairman Angus Woods who will outline the developments leading up to and since the budget and further necessary action to support and maintain our suckler cow herd. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank the committee for, for inviting us in here today. Um, in the IFA, we are fully committed to supporting our national suckler herd and the approximate 70,000 full and part-time farmers involved in the enterprise. In practice, this means campaigning hard to get government to provide additional targeted direct support for sucklers and also working to secure a price premium for quality suckler beef. On the numbers, uh, the most recent numbers from the Department of Agriculture show we are now down to approximately 67,000 farmers, a drop of almost 9,800 over the last 10 years. Uh, cow numbers are also down, approximately 76,000 in the last 10 years. But I would like to point out that uh, our, our suckler registrations in the last number of years have been falling at a rate of 30 to 40,000 per year, which is significantly more than uh, what would look at, like at first viewing. Following an intensive IFA campaign on sucklers throughout 2018, and with substantial help from members of this committee, 
The Minister for Agriculture announced an additional 20 million of national resources to assist the suckler herd in Budget 2019. The new beef environmental pilot scheme worth €40 Euros per suckler cow will be introduced in January 2019. While this was a clear recognition by the Minister of the income problems in the suckler sector and the €40 Euros per cow is welcome, it is not enough and it is clear a lot more needs to be done to help sustain the suckler sector. We have met with the Department of Agriculture on the implementation of the scheme. The Department has outlined that the beep will involve a simple application in February, weighing the cows and calves once during the year and submitting the details to ICBF by app, online or via paper. We have made it clear the full €40 Euros per cow must be paid to farmers. In addition, we have strongly emphasised that the measures under the new scheme must be kept simple and be farmer friendly. The beef data and genomic scheme, which is worth 44.4 million per animal to 24,200 suckler farmers, got bogged down in unnecessary bureaucracy because the government didn't listen to farmers in the design stage. However, payments of the 100 euros per cow on the first 10 cows and the 80 euros on the remainder cannot be ignored considering the low levels of income in suckling. The scheme has completed four years and has two more to run in 2022. Now is the time to complete a review of the scheme, work out how it can be changed and simplified, and plan for its future continuation. In CAP 2020, in the IFA, we are lobbying hard at both national and European level to reverse the budget cuts proposed by the Commission and to seek an increase in the CAP budget. We want Member States to increase their contributions to protect direct payments and farm income and take account of inflation. Capped direct payments are critically important to livestock farmers and increasing targeted payments under Pillar 2 will be essential. We must be aware of the fact that originally cap payments such as a special beef premium, slaughter premium and suckler cow premium were targeted, targeted at livestock farmers. Many beef farmers have witnessed severe cuts to their direct payments and incomes over the last number of cap reforms and this cannot continue in the Hogan reforms. Increased targeted supports for sucklers must come from a larger cap pillar too and additional national resources. IFA has been very clear it cannot involve any cuts to the basic payment scheme. Suckler farmers must be properly rewarded with a significant beef price premium to reflect the superior quality and higher production standards and associated costs. In recent meetings with Agriculture Minister Michael Creed and the factories, we have proposed a significant suckler bread bonus for prime cattle coming from the suckler herd. The meat industry has emphasised the importance of maintaining the suckler herd from a quality and marketing perspective and they must match this with a price premium. A strong live export trade to drive competition and provide alternative market outlets is essential for the beef sector and the suckler cow herd. Government needs to support the live export trade strongly and increase capacity, particularly considering the increase in our dairy cow numbers. The Minister and the Department working with the exporters, Board Bia, the ferry companies and shippers need to target a major increase in live exports for 2019. Chairman, there are many challenges to the Irish beef sector and our specialised suckler cow sector. Brexit, cap reform, McCursor trade negotiations, beef prices below the cost of production. However, the biggest single income is low farm incomes. Incomes on suckler farms are way too low and farmers are under severe pressure. The latest Chagas figures for 2018 point to an income of only just over 10,000 a 19% income fall from 2017. This is not sustainable and government action must be taken to address this. So, Chairman, in conclusion, we need a much stronger and more supportive policy from government for the suckler cow sector and we need to maintain our vitally important suckler cow herd. In order to do this, we needed a targeted direct payment of €200 Euros per cow, we need major price premium for suckler beef and we need a strong live export trade that will drive competition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Woods and Mr. Healy, uh, we have a number of questioners lined up here. The first questioner is uh, Senator Rose Comer-Walsh, please. Uh, thank you, Cahirlach. And 
Thank you for this report. I think it's hugely important, particularly in the climate that we're in with Brexit and all that, but my particular interest obviously is in it because it impacts so much on the, the west of Ireland, um, with 80% of, uh, of the cows being suckler cows. And I'm deeply concerned around the pressures that are being put on the suckler cow herd and the impact that that will have in the rural economy, um, both in the wider economy and in terms of farm family incomes. You know, when, when, when you say the average income is 12,529, you see, that isn't the average income for the farmers in the West. And I know that that is one survey uh, that's been done, but there's another survey that suggests that the income is more like 3,000 euro um, a year. And I think we just need to be a bit careful in terms of the average figures that we're putting out there because that will obviously impact on, um, on government policy uh, in relation to that. Um, I'm looking here in terms of, um, okay, so this is a couple of different ways to address that and you say in terms of the 200 euro per cow, but also in terms of cap and the possibility that cap might be uh, reduced. Um, and the need for the basic payments um, to be... And I suppose my question to you is, do you, do you understand that ba the basic payments must be weighed in favour, weighted in favour of, uh, of the farms in the West? And you're suggesting a cap, and I'm not quite sure at where you're suggesting the cap should be um, in relation to that. Is it 100,000? And when you say that labour will be taken into, maybe just explain that a bit in terms of that labour would be taken into account um, on that, because you know historically um, the basic payments have uh, been in favour of the bigger farmers, and we can go back to 2000 and 2001 to look at some of the wrongs that were done there that still need to be righted. Um, so what cap are you suggested, and what model are you advocating um, in terms of the basic farm payment is probably my main question. And I just want to ask, and this is supposed to relate as well in terms of the ANC areas, so it's fine we have the details now in terms of the area being extended, but it's obvious that we need um, uh, additional payments there in order to, be, to really be able to, to um, compensate farmers who are on, according to their level of... Um, of constraint uh, in their land that they're trying to, to farm. And finally, I just want to ask you, and uh, of course these are all related because there's nothing that's, that's not connected in terms of farming, but the, I'm really concerned about the AEOS, uh, people who are coming off AEOS at the end of this month. What is there for them? And have you discussed that with uh, the department? Thanks. Thanks, Senator. Next is Deputy Penrose. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks to the IFA group for their presentation. Uh, it was inter it's interesting, but uh, there's nothing new when you live through the middle of this uh, in, the, in the county that I'm in. Uh, you know this firsthand, because every time you meet a farmer, uh, particularly in the Sutter Cow area, um, you, they, and they, they, they'll tell you exactly what's happening on the ground. Uh, and the, the, look, the fall off in stock numbers in the course of West Ireland is. is, is, is Senator Connolly, as I said, there is, is highly dependent upon sucker cows, but in the Midlands, it's fairly, it's a fairly important source of of of, uh, of uh, far, farm and activity, uh, sucker cow production and and, and stuff like that. So the, the fall off is, is is going to continue. So let's 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 not start cutting ourselves. I I I have, I have little time, and I hold little time for anyone who tries to pretend that this is not going to happen. Of course, it's going to happen. We've only looked in our own county. There's a significant level of dairy conversions taking place. Farmers are business people. They're gravitating to where there's a possibility of a, some sort of a decent income. And, you know, it's, it's not just happening in, in Westmead and the Midlands and will happen. It's happening in the, in the, even in the areas there for Deputy Cass County, even Tipperary and Cork. Waterford and, and, and Kilkenny, you know, you see a, a huge drop of sucker cow numbers in the last six or seven years. So there are 35 or 36,000 cows gone out of the system in the last six or seven years. So that's huge. 
We've lost 76 of maybe nearly 80,000 cows in the last seven years. So, um, you know, I, 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 I can see, I, I read the report, the full report there, uh, prepared as if it's a very good one from Professor Hennessy and her colleagues. It's a very useful point. But um, I would say that the IFA themselves at, at the executive level were not surprised by the findings. They'd only been negated what they knew was happening and the poll so they could present it, I suppose, to various people. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, it, it's, it's quite clear. You've only looked here in the last year. Uh, the trend is going to continue because there's a, there's a fall in the income from suckler cows uh, activity. And then you, you relate that to does it, this year in particular. I'd say when the numbers are done at the end of this year, Mr Woods will probably know this better than anybody. Numbers are done at the end of this year. There's going to be another, because there's a significant increase in the input costs even in the current year because of the drought at one level, and of course the, 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 the further shortages like, because of the harsh winter weather, the, there was a prolonged, prolonged winter there. So we have all of this going on, uh, and that is another area that, that, that's going to impact upon the sucker cows. And I was a great advocate for the beef uh, data genomic programme. I was probably one of the strongest advocates here. Now, I know there's teething problems, and I know all this thing about the breed and the stars and the devil is what. That, but I think that can be heard and out now when it comes to the 2020 programme. I think we should, we should get on our hype first now and try and start now to deal with that, all of those issues, to iron them out. But let's be honest, again, with one another, because if we're not honest with one another, we can't be honest with people outside. If it were not for that programme, I think that there'll be a huge number gone altogether for the beef genomic problem. Because there's a significant number of farmers tied into that until 2020 in order to get the benefits of them. And, you know, people may give out about them, but there's benefits there. And there's all that. But if they weren't tied in, I think the acceleration would have been even sharper than what you have outlined here this morning, or this afternoon. So, uh, you know, so I would be at the view that we've, we'd have witnessed sharper falls in, in numbers than, than, than that. And I, I certainly agree with some commenters who have pointed that the fall off in sucker cow numbers could accelerate post 2020 if we do not get our house together and get arguing that we do need a beef genomic programme, apart altogether from its, its impact from its carbon footprint and dealing with, with that aspect of matters, I think, that, I think uh, we, we, could, we could see worse. Um, I, one farmer, I, I spoke actually on the other night to three or four farmers who actually come down to see me at the house. Sometimes when they're in relaxed mode, it's, it's better, you get better. So a couple of farmers told me they're going to be talking to yourselves and others, not in any aggressive way, but say, look, we have to smell the coffee here. We are continually getting price, poor prices. You have the beef processors who are quite happy to see the stock numbers remain in relatively level and, and do their own thing and, you know, relatively constant sucker cow numbers. And they will be continue to behave in, in the fashion we've all become accustomed to, which is the free market model, to actually screw you. Now, I come from a party who doesn't support this absolute free market model and we got condemned many a way along the road for our view that it's not the healthy option shall we say uh, but and so therefore I think this is a great model to study why there should be more socialism in this type of area but in any event let's be clear farmers are now saying look we'd be better off to take our basic pound payments to payments we should be encouraged to put some of our land towards forestry. And if we put 10 acres, we get the X premium. If we put 15 to 20 acres, we get an X plus Y premium. And this is the way they're thinking. Those are four farmers now who are in this beef area. They're at the stage now that they're wondering, our, our, our children, one farmer told me, and I know his three sons, he says, hey, no one's going to succeed me in this game. 
So we have to, if they're talking like that, and you're, you're coming from the best mead, which is a traditional beef farm in county, uh, I'm not making this up. I can, bring, I can bring you, one of them has sent me in a thing, and I'm going to send it to somebody, what he wants done. He says, look, he says, let's face reality. Don't be, don't be skirting around it, because I was kind of talking maybe a bit. <coughs> so the, the other, the, so, so the, the, the equation is simple enough. Lower minimal market returns relative to the input costs of the cost of production. Uh, and let's call it out today, without the basic farm payment system, uh, the industry would disappear, as it would not be viable. So we, you're right. You've identified something I've been at for the last two years, the cap budget, and the loss of the almost 11 or 12 billion from the UK government. That is absolutely staggering. And in the absence of EU member states making up the deficit, if we don't get some, that could be critical and crucial. That could well be the situation. So I, I, we have to be truthful again. There are four or five member states, very large member states out there, who have no intention or have certainly indicated very clearly they have no intention of making a contribution to make up the deficit. So let's not fool ourselves. If we got the Irish government in the morning to make up, to, to submit, which the Irish government have indicated their desire to do so, Chairperson, you know, we can't be left lee alone. That's not going to make a, we, 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 We're not going to be making up the deficit of 10 or 12 billion. So, you know, we have to, we have to be very careful about that. The good, the good things, I suppose, the, the, the losses that we would, part of the, the impact of in rural areas and uh, impact, you know, it's a highly exported oriented industry, I suppose, with nine of every ten animals we produce going into export and huge foreign air, earnings uh, and export uh, capacity derived from that. The sustainability uh, and, 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 and the beef genomics uh, pro, uh, program and, and the impact of that. And that. And given the demand for, I suppose, quality beef across the world, and I think I heard the IFA people making that argument before, when people are saying, sure, look, well, if we don't produce it, somebody else will. And the Brazilians are actually, you know, ready to capitalise. They're, they're knocking down half their forests and then transporting stuff across the world. And so that's the huge, that's, that's a double whammy. <laughs> you know, you're taking out the sequestration capacity and you're then increasing it at the other end by the transport issues. So all that's there. We have a clean, green image, grass-fed level of production. And so we, we, can, we can get back on that. But, you know, we, we, better, we better kind of face up to the reality that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware of family circumstances. If I suck to family, close to home, so we say this. I have nephews and nieces, and I can't see them taking up the, 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 the Suckland enterprise that's somewhere there uh, in the current climate, because I could never see them. How could you rear two or three children and maybe put them through college or anything else on that income? So I don't know. It's, it's a big job, and it's very easy for everybody to give out about even farm organisations. For once, I'm not going to be castigating you. <laughs> he used to be shocked at Christmas time. <laughs> no, I'm not. In this situation, because it's not easy. And unless, you can, unless we can get the price structure right. But the problem is, you have to, have to be honest, how long will, will European consumers and everybody else continue to subsidise? Notwithstanding that's, that's the primary objective of CAP. Somebody, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have yellow coats across the continent on a different topic because it seems to be the in thing now. And don't forget that that's the way consumers, consumers will forget that they're getting a cheap, healthy product, and they'll, they'll, they'll kick up when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the coffers become bare in their, in the, in the, in their financial jurisdiction of, of, of their exchequers. So it's, it's, it's a big one, and of course, you know, coming from where we are, from the county I do, we want to see it not to survive, but to thrive, and to give that. But, we have to face up to it, and I think you, you should have a major, I, I can't tell farm organisations what to do, I think we should have a major thing focused specifically on this in maybe February or March and see what, 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 what can be done on a, in a constructive way to ensure the sustainability of the beef industry going forward. And I certainly would support any efforts you make in that regard. Um, Deputy Kenny.
Chairman. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your, your presentation and for the report. Um, the importance of the, of the suckler cow sector is certainly something that I'm most conscious of from Leitrim, where we have there's actually five marks in County Leitrim, and all of them, their stable is to sell in the Wienland calf, and farmers coming from other parts of the country to buy them and, and bring them away because our land generally isn't good enough for to finish the cattle. And I suppose that's um, while there may be suckler enterprises in many areas, for many suckler farmers in other counties, when I speak to them, they also finish as well as suckling, whereas in, in, in Leitrim, that possibility is pretty much not there, as it is in, in a lot of, of the western counties. I, I was looking at, at page 16 of the report where the family farm income and cattle on, and the income on cattle, and far, on cattle rearing farms, and from the market compared to the, the subsidies, and what, what the income is, and, and really the family farm income, uh, and, and you can see from right the way through from 2000 up to 2016, at around the, two th at the, around the, the, the 10, 12,000 euro mark, but in actual fact, from the market, it's practically zero. So if the subsidies weren't there, there is no money at all. And that's, that's one of the, the big issues that we have with it. Uh, and a recognition that we have to really come home to is that this, this, this is an enterprise which is making no money if there were not for the, the direct payments and were not for the various, and nearly all the suckler farmers are also involved in loss or whatever other uh, environmental schemes are available because that's the nature of their farm and it suits them to do that. Um, the, the, the pressure coming on, and I, I see it coming from everywhere, from, from the dairy sector, where, uh, where land is, is good enough for to, for to switch over to dairy, and that pressure is coming on all the time, and there's more and more farmers getting out of suckler farm and going into dairy because that's where the money is. Um, that will put pressure on the number of weanland calves and therefore the number of beef cattle that we see coming into the marts and going on ahead to be finished, etc. Now, the, the, and I just want like, to tease this out a little bit, Eugene, in regard to the €200 Euro per cow, and I absolutely agree that you know, we have to come up with, it, with some solution here. The fear I would have, and the fear that some farmers have even said to me, is if we got the €200 Euro a cow, would we end up that the factories would take it? That the price would actually start to slip back? and that we'd end up in a situation where we'd be getting the €200 Euro a cow, but we'd, we'd, the prices would be contracting, and uh, because there'd be, there'd be this subsidy in place, that production would go up, and therefore that would be an excuse to push, push prices down, and that the farmer would end up actually not gaining very much from it at all. Because that seems to be the trend when you look at the, the family farm income on the charts going down all the years. It changed very little, no matter what scheme came or went, no matter how much or how high or low things went, it stayed pretty much the same. It's, it's, it's almost like one of these things, you know, we'll, we'll keep them at a certain level that they'll survive and we'll always get the cheap raw material from them and we'll make the money on it and there, there you stay. And you just get in, every, so, every couple of years the farmer gets a middling good year and it gives them that little bit of confidence to stick at it. But then they get three or four bad ones, and they're, when they're about to go out again, they get another middle. And it's, it's all when you think there was some master puppeteer somewhere in the background playing this game with the Irish suckler sector in particular. And, and I, just, I just, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat cynical about all of this and, and where it all ends up. And I know that um, all the farm organisations are, of course, lobbied by the farmers, and the pressure is coming on from all angles to try and come up with a solution to this. But the big point about it is that the suckler sector, as a sector, creates a huge economic activity in that, that micro-economy in the, in the region where it exists. And I certainly know that in County Leitrim, we know that in many other areas. Like, if, if you didn't have the suckler farmer there, the, when, the, when the cow calves, there's a vet needed, there's meal needed, there's all the various inputs, it's all there. there good husbandry, all of those things, they're involved in gloss, as they say, because it suits their style of farming. If they were not suckling, it is probably, the, and I think it's, it's recognised at some point in the, in, in the report, that it, it has that multiplier effect, hugely, in, in rural areas where there's very, very low incomes already. The other point that I'm just wondering, and I, I searched through the report, and I didn't read it, every single word of it, but I, I searched through it to try and see as to if you look at the suckler farmers, particularly in the West, their level of um, single farm payment compared to other areas. And I expect it's low. I expect it's much lower than, and with all due respect to the, the, the suckler farmers in Westmead, I'd say a lot of them would be finishing the cattle and would probably be a little bit more intensive and therefore back in 2000 and 2001 they'd have 
got a, got a, a, a better basic payment, and it's based on that compared to the, the fill outside of Balnadlera that has maybe 60 acres on the side of a mountain trying to rear a couple of cows and have a few calves on it. They, they got a raw deal 20 years ago, and they're still getting that raw deal today. I think that needs to be recognised. And, and I take your point, you know, that you don't want to see any farmer reduce or lose money. But somewhere or other there has to be a recognition that there was a raw deal for those farmers, and that's the very reason why very, very many of them are going out of it. And when the, the farmers on the better land want to buy a decent Wienland in two or three years' time and they can't get them because those farmers are gone, then we'll see what's going to happen to this, this, this whole sector will disappear. Because that's what I see happening. You come to a, a crucial tipping point in it. And I'd say if it reduces by another 15 to 20 per cent, and in the next few years the way it's going, that's, that's what's going to happen. You'll reach that tipping point, and at that stage it will be beyond recovery. And then there'll be an emphasis for to see can we get the beef cattle from the, the dairy sector. And I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. But there may be some movements in that direction, and there may be some improvements in breeding and all of that, and they're, they're talking about, about, about various uh, genetics and all that. I, I just don't see how the dairy cow can produce the kind of beef calf that's needed for to follow through for, for, the, for the quality of meat that Ireland produces. Um, the, the, the price really is what it's all about, and, and that's what that, that figure two on page 16 tells me, is that ultimately, the, prob the big problem here in all of this is the price that the farmer gets. And that's the price the farmer gets in the factory, and therefore the price that they get for the Wienland if they're only producing the Wienland back down the line. Uh, and that's, if you like, the, the, the big elephant in the room that has to be dealt with. And I've raised this with the Minister on numerous occasions, and he comes back with the same mantra that he can't interfere, interfere in the pricer. Uh, we, we know that, you know, that there's various rules there. But at the same time, the Irish exchequer and the Irish taxpayer is paying huge amounts of money for to market all this beef all over the world. And we're sending a board B uh, here, there, and the other place for to find new markets. To whose benefit? You know, it's certainly there's no benefit being seen to the farmer that I reference in Ballinalair that's, that's rearing a few cows and selling a few wainlands. They're getting very little of it. So there needs to be a recognition that if the Irish taxpayer is going to put the money in for to market this product, for to do, for to, which, which has a huge potential and a huge spin-off, as I say, no one's denying that. But there needs to be recognition that there has to be some way of ensuring that that primary producer gets a decent return for their effort. And that, that seems to be missing in all of this. And I, I would hope that the 200 euro cow that you talk of as being, if you like, you know, this golden bullet that's going to solve it all. I, I would hope that's the case. I'm somewhat cynical of it because I see what has happened to every scheme that has ever come up before. At the end of the day, there was a way in which the taxpayers' money or the European money ended up in the hands of the same people. Somehow or other, they managed to get it back to the big guys. And when I talk about the big guys, I'm talking about mainly the processors in the supermarkets. They're the ones that end up with all the money, and the producers end up being squeezed. Um, Really, it's, it's about balance in respect of all of that. And how do you do that? How do you introduce a scheme there that you're going to make sure that, that it, it, it has the impact that you want it to have without having unintended consequences? And I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to try and, and, you know, work with anyone we could to do that and to, and to make that happen. But ultimately, the report and, and what the report is saying, really, it's, it's a cry to say, look, here's a sector go down the swanee if something isn't done soon. And what has to be done, in, in my mind, is there has to be some way of ensuring that it's about price. We can talk about subsidising as long as we like, and we will need to subsidise. I, I, I understand that concept, and there has to be a way of doing that. But at the end of the day, the problem we've got here is that the European consumer is paying a dear price for excellent quality product, but the European producer here in Ireland is not getting the return for it. And that disconnect is the, is the big problem. So, um, you know, I... I I, I, just, I just don't see how the 200 euro a cow, while excellent if it works, if it works, excellent, but please show me how it will work without having the unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, at the beginning, um, Deputy McConnell. Thank you, um, Chairperson, and just to thank the AFA for coming in today and welcome, um, welcome your President and uh, the, uh, along with your team and also to also to recognise the work um, done by your own organisation in commissioning this report um, and also those who contributed to it, Dr. Um, Professor Thea Hennessy, Dr. Justin Doran, Professor Joe Bogue and Dr. Lana Rapar. 
um, and certainly I think it's a valuable uh, assessment of the challenges facing the suckler sector <coughs> and of the difficulty it, it is experiencing and which uh, it's a, it would appear we're going to continue to experience certainly in the short term. Um, just a few questions um, overall which I, I would just like you to, to flesh out uh, more. Um, first of all, in, in relation to the return for farmers, and undoubtedly um, it has been a very low marginal uh, sector, uh, and has to, has farmers, beef farmers, suckler farmers have had to do it very, very well in order to make a profit. Um, but yet it is the most, uh, it is the sector that is the largest number of farmers in the country and that so many people depend on. Um, but uh, sir, when you look at the last four or five years, even, for example, I see from the Irish Independent today uh, showing the figures um, nationally, showing 11% drop in suckler cow figures from 2012 to, uh, to last year. And even if you look at my own county of Donegal, um, it's dropped from 45,000 in 2012 to uh, just over 39,000 now. And that's not in a county where there'd be a big transition into milk. Um, like, like some of the southern counties, that's people starting to keep less because simply there isn't, they, they aren't seeing a profit margin, um, unfortunately, in it at the moment. Um, in relation to the margin that, fact, that, that, that farmers are actually getting, um, I'd be interested in your assessment as to what impact the, fact, the, the factories have in relation to that in terms of the margin that they are taking. Um, because certainly uh, it would appear whenever the numbers go up, the factories do squeeze their margin. Uh, on the other hand, they, make the, they defend themselves by indicating that they do be paying a European price, average price, um, and that is their defence. But I'd be interested just further in relation to your perspective on, on their role in the food chain um, and uh, uh, in relation to the, the passing on of the margin. Also, do you feel that the increasing use of uh, and uh, increasing numbers of cattle going through feedlots um, in, in recent years, that that is having um, an impact um, on, on the margin the farmers are getting. Um, I'd also be interested in relation to uh, the actual beef grid um, and whether you think that that is something which needs to be looked at again uh, and, and addressed, particularly in relation to uh, many farmers would feel that they're missing out on proper payments and also in relation to how the quality assurance scheme is operated um, and the many instances where farmers um, don't get paid the quality assurance despite having followed the, the rules that, uh, that pertain to it. Um, obviously, in, as you, we, we've talked on a number of occasions in relation to the need for the €200 Euro, um, per sucker or cow. I know it's something you've campaigned very actively on. Certainly, it's, it's something Fianna Fáil have been very, very proactive on and, as you know, brought a motion before the Dáil uh, over, the, over the summer as well, or early, earlier in the summer. Um, in relation to how you would see that €200 Euro being um, applied and implemented, I know obviously it, it's through exchequer funds, but uh, do you, uh, it, what, what do you believe the best way of delivering that um, to farmers um, would, would be? Um, and also then just obviously the challenge that we're continuously having to meet and it's going to become more significant uh, over, over the next number of short years is the issue of climate change and specifically in relation to the suckler cow sector. Um, uh, what, what do you think do we need to start diff doing differently in terms of suckler cow farms that could contribute to that? Um, I know we've, had, we've seen the Smart Farming Initiative which you've been very much uh, as a pilot, which you have been very involved in, has shown um, has shown that uh, gains can be made without impacting on production. But um, in relation to the sucker cow sector, what additional measures do you feel we can do there um, that uh, will contribute to our targets without necessarily um, affecting production? And, and the unfortunate reality is, unless we can find ways to ensure that there is a proper margin. Uh, in it for suckler farmers, we are going to see production dropping off, and that has been the trend. Um, and unless we can address that, um, we, are, we are going to see going to see that continue. And just one final point as well, and it has been <coughs> mentioned here at the meeting today, and that is the, the need for a, a premium for for suckler cow um, beef. Um, in relation to the potential for that, um, how much potential do you believe there is, there is there for that? Because we have seen increasingly in recent years where particularly your British multiples and 50% of our beef goes into the British market now, that they have been quite happy to take beef coming off the dairy herd 
um, for uh, 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 for stay cuts and for 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 factor for for uh, sh sh shelf cuts. Um, and where do, how do we get a premium uh, for suckler cow beef? And do you see um, do you see um, potential uh, in relation to that, and, and where you would see it? Good chairperson. Next deputy. Uh, next is um, deputy Cal. Thanks, Chairman. So, you know, we had the minister in here a couple of weeks ago. First of all, welcome to the delegation. And, uh, we had the minister in here a couple of weeks ago, and I suppose I had a, a fair outburst on him about where the beef industry is at. And unfortunately, there's a huge level of despondency out there. And um, you know, farmers just can't can't stay taking the returns that they're getting. And unfortunately, people will start to vote with their feet, and they will start to leave the industry. I suppose. You know, 40,000 40, um, kill per week is just not sustainable. And, um, you know, we had an old mantra that once we went over 30,000 head, we weren't able to sell that, that amount of cattle profitably. We're at 40,000 head now for, I suppose, two months or more. And unfortunately, we're bearing, we're bearing the brunt of it in the returns that have been given. The only way that that can be, you know, reduced and retain our heritage is with live exports. And I suppose we've had misfortunes with Turkey there, um, where the Turkey market is virtually close to us. And again, you know, we hear a lot of nominations about different markets opening up, but, you know, they're not going to take any, any hu huge volume of cattle. I think next spring, um, it's absolutely essential that we get a very significant number of, bl of black and white calves out of the country. And um, I think we have to stress black and white calves and have to be freezing calves out, out, out of the country. And I think, you know, we need to get upwards I'd say four to five hundred thousand calves out of the country next spring. If we're going to bring any balance back into the kill, that's going to take um, that's going to take a period of time. Just I just want to make a few observations, and you know we're focusing here on the suckler herd, and I accept that and the suckler herd is under pressure. But I think if we start to put farmer against farmer, I think you know we're, we're we're going to go down a slippery slope, and you know this shouldn't be. The suckler herd versus the beef produce coming from the dairy herd. You know, this, we're close, the, the returns from all 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 systems in beef farming at the moment are not sustainable. Whether it is calf to beef, whether it is finishing the suck the whale and its part in the west of Ireland, whatever system you mention, the returns just aren't sustainable. The end price that's that's been paid and the cost the cost of producing that beef, um, you know, the, the the figures are not are not balancing. And people are going to get out of winter finishing. They're going to get out of calf to beef systems. You know, they're going to leave suckler farming. All systems are under pressure, and I think, you know, that's something I think we have to recognise. Now, we also have the problem of the Jersey Cross, and that is something that's going to have to be faced up to as well. And um, the Jersey Cross and the the meat yields or the lack of meat yield from the Jersey Cross, and I suppose. You know, some farmers um, trying to trying to, especially with live exports, trying to um, offload their Jersey calves or something other than what they are, and you know that can't be allowed to happen either. And I think Tigers have a little, have a, I think a good bit answer here on that. There's no evaluation of the minus cost that there, the minus profit there is for having Jersey in your progeny. That's the loss in the price of the calf and the loss of the carcass weight for the cow. And I think those, you know. We have an awful lot of monitor farms run by Tigers, which are promoting crossbreds. But to me, there's never been a focus on the negative on the negative side of income um, from, from the beef returns that are there. And every farm has beef returns, whether it's in the sale of a calf or the sale of a cold cow. And you know, that has never been factored, in my view, that has never been factored in at all into the EBI and the profitability of any system. And I think you know that's something that has to be addressed. My colleague Deputy McConnell all day referred to the grid, and uh, you know I think the grid hasn't done what it what it was meant to do, and I think the grid needs needs to be re-examined. Now, is that going to solve all the ills of the industry? Uh, or the, uh, not going to solve all the ills of the industry, but I think where the base is set is wrong. The base should be set at the old level, and it should be bonuses from there up. Rather, we see a huge proportion of the kill are suffering minus losses on the grid. And I think the only one that has made money out of the grid is the beef processors, and they're doing that with the quality assurance scheme as well. Whereas, you know, the, 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 the amount of cattle that are failing to qualify for quality assurance is very substantial.
but you'll never see that on a packet of, a packet of beef that's for sale in Sainsbury's in the UK. You won't see whether it was an O minus steel or an O equals or an O plus. It'll be sold as Irish beef. Or if you go into McDonald's, you'll see, you know, this is quality assured beef. But the farmer is getting, um, in the vast majority of cases, the farmer isn't getting any recompense for, for being in quality assurance. And, you know, we can talk about all our schemes, quality assurance, and, you know, that we're producing the best beef in the world and our suckler beef is, 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 is of, a, of a great quality. And it is. But unfortunately, retailers and consumers as well will take all that from us, but they won't pay us anything in return. And, you know, the higher we set our standards here, the retailers will love it, the consumers will, will, will be happy with it as well. But unfortunately, there's no premium being paid, being paid for that. And, you know, we have, as I said, we have beef farmers in, you know, in, the, in a very despondent mood. We have direct payments under pressure. You have Mercosur lurking in the background, and you have also Brexit, uh, which is, I suppose, the greatest, the greatest challenge of all. So it's easy to understand, you know, why farmers are, 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 are very despondent. But the one thing I'm saying, you know, your, your report is welcome, but it's, uh, I'm going to repeat the point. Let's not set farmer against farmer. Our beef industry is not making money for anyone that's involved in it, and we need, we need, we need to resolve that. The suckler herd needs help if, we're going to, if, we're, if, we're, if it is going to survive, and I accept that fully. And as, as Deputy McConnell Loga said, we had a motion down early, early in the year. It has to get help, and it has to get specialist help. But let's not, let's not go down a slippery slope of, of, of setting one system against the other. There's no system making money, and you know, it, has, it, has, it has to change, or, you know, um, our, our, beef in, our beef industry will disappear. And I think you know, the figures that are at your report about what it contributes to the local economy you know, cannot be overestimated. And you know, um, the, the, the contribution of, of active farmers to a rural area you know, just, can, just, can, just can't be just can't be, um, just can't, cannot be overestimated. And I suppose, you know, we have people um, pushing forestry, and um, Deputy Kenny here is, is, is very strong that when you bring too much forestry into any area, it's terminal for that area. And I think, you know, we want to be very, very conscious of that when we're talking about our, be our beef industry, because in large parts of the country, if our beef industry disappears, it will be replaced by trees. And when that happens, the services will disappear as well, and those rural communities will, dis will, 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 disappear, will disappear as well. But, you know, our beef industry is at a crossroads, and, you know, what's there at the moment cannot continue. No one is going to stay um, taking a hammering after hammering, and as has been said by a number of speakers, you know, the next generation definitely won't go down this route. And, you know, the, the, we, we discussed it here uh, earlier before the meeting commenced in public session about the amount of young farmers uh, um, entering farming. And um, if people see the returns that are there and the lack of profitability um, in, whatever, in whatever beef, in whatever beef um, regime that they're in, whether it's calf to beef or suckler farming or whatever, they're just going to say, well, that's not for me. And they will, do, they will take other options with the land. And, you know, once those other options are taken, there's no reversing out of them. Deputy uh, Senator Daly. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I suppose everything has, has, has nearly been covered. There's, not, there's, 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 there's nothing new that you're going to come up with in, in, in this debate. I think everybody knows the situation of the sector, I suppose, of agriculture in general, you could say. But, like, it's a well-known fact I'm a sector farmer myself. And, this evening's proceedings is not doing anything to lift my spirits, but at the end of the day, we're, we're all solution driven. But where, where are we going to get the solution? The, the report is excellent, it highlights the difficulties of the sector. Like, there's one elephant in the room, Chair, and it, it has been highlighted the contribution that the sector makes to the rural economy. And the only thing, around me in particular, anyway, that I can speak for my neighbours and people who I know are. Suckler farmers, and suckler farmers for the reason that Deputy Penrose has mentioned earlier, the area I come from, it's not, it's not possible to go into dairy. It's not possible to go into tillage on a large scale. It is suckler and sheep is probably the only two sectors that are conducive to the area. But as I say, as has been pointed out in the, in the report, the contribution that the suckler herd is making <coughs> to local, small, rural economies, and it's the jobs it's creating, in a lot of cases, the only thing that's sustaining the suckler farm is that the farmer holds one of those jobs, let it be on a part-time or a full-time basis. And it's, all, it's his off-farm income that is sustaining the enterprise. And 
by nature of the types of jobs they're taking, it's a double whammy. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a perfect storm in that if there is mass abandonment of the suckler herd in areas like I'm talking about, them little jobs, them little part-time jobs are the first jobs that are going to go. And if the, the people we're talking about are going to be hit on the double. And that's, that's a frightening scenario, but it, it's, it's totally predictable if, if we cannot sustain the sector. Now, a lot of times when you raise an issue or a problem in any sector or any, any walk of life or inside this bubble in here, you get directed back to the solution being education. But on this one, I think a bit of PR and education could be part of the solution. Leaving, leaving the fiscal uh, answers on the, the 200 euro cow and the uh, cap, etc., leave, leaving the financial side of it aside, it's a sector that's getting damned when you talk about climate change. And it's not being highlighted out there to the general public that it is by virtue of the fact that we're an agriculture society and when you compare it to transport or power, uh, electricity, whatever, that we never had an industrial revolution in this country. So it's getting negative press and people out there promoting veganism. If we all go vegan, the whole problem is solved and we'll still drive around in diesel guzzling cars and lorries and fly all across the world. So we need as was collectively here inside in the political bubble and yourselves possibly as the representative bodies to try and get a sea change in the attitude. We talk about premiums for our beef, our, our suckler beef, but 99 times out of 100, the housewife, she shops with her purse, not with her eyes. And, and there's suckler calves, dairy calves, dry cows, everything going into the food chain and it's all been consumed. Like, how well are we locally, nationally, and indeed internationally promoting? We, we all praise Borbia and the export markets we get and the markets we get, but are there questions to be asked about how well they really are promoting the carbon footprint, the good carbon footprint, and the uh, high quality by virtue of the fact that it's grass fed of, of our suckler beef? Is, is it getting the premium promotion that it deserves? And uh, until it's been respected internationally and respected on the, on the shelves of the supermarkets, there cannot or probably will not be a premium. So we might have to go back to the very basics and go and start promoting this product again. Might be, it might look like we're reversing the, the procedure, but you might have to go back to, to the very basics and start, in my opinion. And I don't have the answers. I don't know where the answers are going to come, to come from. But it, it might be something as basic as having to go back and start re-advertising and re-promoting and re-highlighting the quality, because it's, it's not being highlighted enough. And there could be a bubble out there. I, I, I don't like saying it, but there could be a bubble out there. And as bad as the thing is, it could be ready to burst. Because what promotion we have done on this green, grass-fed, suckler beef, where are the dairy calves going when they're fat? Will somebody cop on someday that maybe it's not, they're not all getting what they think they're getting and that the bubble could burst? I'd just like to hear a little bit more opinion on that from, from your side. Thanks, Senator. And Deputy Pringle. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, look, I mean, everything has more or less been said. Um, I was just wondering, just in relation to the increases that are proposed in terms of the, the payment from the, the, under the cap or whatever, how is that going to be stopped? Uh, what Deputy Kenny said, how are you going to stop the beef? fact is the prices won't improve in the factories so what is the point of it or is it just solely that we have to the the government or the eu or whoever just increase the payments so that the so the the far the beef factories will continue to keep the price of prices down and that's the reality of the situation um i don't know how you get around that or what you do about that um but i mean we have to try and find some way to find something something different in relation to it and um, Possibly, I think Deputy Penrose maybe mentioned some of what the solutions could be as well as maybe by having some alternatives where farmers can put some of the land on, into farm forestry or whatever and get a premium for that. That's, that's, that's over and above. It's not related to, directly to the, the suckler cows that they have so that they can, they can increase their income in that way. Um, and that bizarrely would actually go some way to meeting the, the carbon reduction um, requirements as well but because the, the basically the factory is just going to capitalize on whatever 
farmers get. And maybe maybe we just have to put our hands up and say, well, that's the way it's going to be, and um, and that's the reality of the situation. And uh, the, the so the, the so for every. Hundred euro you do get from the cap or from the government or whatever towards the scheme, that's going to drop, drop the uh, uh, same amount in the factories, and that's fair enough, and, and that's what we, we'll have to we'll have to live with that. But I, I mean, I think we should be saying that, and so if that, if that is the case, um, but I think that's we have to try. And, I don't know how we get around it, but that's now. Also, I think we have to look at. We have to talk about this, the circular herd versus the dairy herd. Everybody they say, says that the, the dairy herd is causing the problems with, for the circular now, and that the, the whole carbon footprint or the ex, extra carbon is penalising, and that the, 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 the circular herd is responsible for it, or that the, we're making money out of the dairy herd or whatever. I mean, that all has to be taught out, thought out as well. I think, and um, it can't be looked in isolation either. Um, it's a very difficult situation. I don't know how you how you find a solution to it, um, and where it comes from. And listen to what the contribution from the members here today. There's no way solution to it either. Um, so it's going to be interesting. It's interesting to see how it actually develops. But I would just be interested to see. Uh, do you have any ideas of how the fa the factories can actually you can keep that for any increase from the government can be kept separate from what the factories a reduction in the factories that has been outlined here the impact it's going to have so we'll be back here next year with the same situation that is still not going to be any any positive uh, outcome that's an unfortunate thing about it. Deputy and finally Senator Mulhern. Thanks. Apologies, I didn't get to hear your presentation, but I have read, and I had actually read this report previously, which I thought was a helpful report uh, in advance of the budget. I had read it. Um, I was required in the Shannon. Um, it's just a few questions, and hopefully it's not too repetitious, but I, I think we're all on the same themes anyway. Um, the weak position, a bargaining position of the farmer in the food supply chain, and the uh, European, the, the efforts made at EU level to address this. Now I understand that that's particularly going to have an impact on the multiple retailers or that's how it would be envisaged. And again, just to ask uh, how you would propose to address the issue around uh, the meat processors and, and the factories and to get a fairer price. Um, also a question for you. Um, it was brought to my attention a report by Iowa State University which shows that of the retail price of beef, that farmers there are getting 45% of it and with our own farmers only getting half that and, and why is that and, and you know what can we learn from that or, or what are the differences there that would give rise to beef farmers there getting more for their animals and just on the issue of the beef forum which I know that you removed yourselves from is there not a need for the, the beef forum to resume and come back and that everybody sits around the table and that issues, including this concern in relation to the price that meat processors are giving to uh, the farmers, to the primary producer, can be thrashed out um, and that all the stakeholders are at the table. Because clearly, uh, I have argued, as the chair before uh, knows, when, even when we had Board BIA here, it, there's always talk of the free market and we have to let market forces operate to an extent. But the, the market is supported by government and, and we, the taxpayer pays for Board B are finding the new markets. The minister goes abroad winning new markets. All this helps the, the meat factories and all the, the retailers concerned. So there, there is a point at which if they don't acknowledge that farmers, it's unsustainable if they don't get a better price for their beef, then there won't be the farmers in it. And of course, we know that there are issues around land mobility, younger farmers, First of all, being able to access land, but second of all, being interested in doing so because of issues like this, especially on the beef side, and obviously it's beef we're talking about here today. Um, so that's, I suppose, just generally it, just some feedback. Again, apologies yeah. if there's some repetition there. Thanks, Senator. Just to finish up before, to conclude before I go back to you, uh, yourselves, I suppose there's no doubt there's, there's no silver bullet to this particular um, difficulty that's there at the moment. Just a couple of points, and again I'd make the point, uh, reiterate the point to Senator Michelle Mayer about the unfair trading practices, uh, and maybe your comments on the legislation that's been introduced in Europe at the moment, and how we could maybe make that stronger from our point. Personally, I don't think the legislation that's been proposed is strong enough. 
uh, and maybe what you think we, uh, as, as, uh, as, a, as a parliament or at national level, could be doing to ensure that is stronger. You know, uh, there is talk before about, uh, and you made recommendations, I think, yourselves, about a similar type process to the have across the water, where it would have an independent arbitrator in place to deal with difficulties in the whole sector. Uh, a lot of talk has been here about the processors. I think the large multiples have a huge part to play in the overall, in the overall equation as well. I think that needs to be tackled. Um, I do think, uh, again, the point Deputy Cahill made, I think farmer against farmer is not a way to go. I think uh, it's a solution driven thing, and everybody in the whole agriculture sector is a part to play to solve the difficulty or help to solve the difficulty going forward. And finally, the part that producer groups might play uh, going forward. There's been some talk about that in the past, not as much in more recent times. Some other sectors, some other groups have been talking up that particular proposition in more recent times, and maybe our comments on that as well. So, whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, Chairman, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll start with yourself and, and go back that way, because you've raised a few points there, and particularly in relation to the UP, UTPs. And I was actually in Brussels yesterday um, meeting with uh, Minister Costinger and uh, we met with Commissioner Hogan as well. Now, it was mainly around the cap, but we also got to talking about the UTPs because they failed to reach agreement last week in the trilogues. Um, now, there is a meeting of uh, that convened again for tomorrow, and they're hoping that, uh, because it's arranged again that in the background they have agreement on, on the way to move it forward. And that's crucial. Now, uh, so at, at least it's continuing to, to move on. And I think the Commissioner is very anxious that over the next few months um, that that will move on at pace because with the European elections and maybe the Commission changes uh, this time next year. Um, so, you know, hopefully they will reach some sort of agreement in that tomorrow and it'll, then it'll be able to be uh, moved on for the legal uh, status. Um, some areas uh, that it might be improved. Well, first of all, there's a three-year review on it, uh, so I know three years down the line is, but at least we'll be able to see what the teething problems are, what are the areas that might need improvement. As you mentioned it yourself, absolute need for an independent ombudsperson. Um, we said, was it here in this room? It was one of those rooms, anyways, where we more or less heard the CCPC <coughs> say very clearly, and you remember it yourself, you know, that they were there to defend the consumer and um, had not had really very little interest in defending the, the producer and said that you know they needed a person or w there needed to be a different person in to do that and I think there's a perfect example there in the UK with Christine Tegan who's the UK grocery code adjudicator who has stated very clearly that the very fact that she's in the position nearly renders that position not required but take her out of it for a few weeks and then you'd see what would happen because the, the retailers are, they know she's there and they're, they're afraid of her. And I suppose the fact that they fund it and if, there's, if she hasn't to spend that money doing um, research into unfair trading practices, then they get that money back. So there's um, the need for that. And I think the other area that there's huge need for, and some of it goes back to maybe uh, earlier questions as well um, in relation to the factories. <coughs> That is, there's a huge area of transparency within this Agri-Markets Task Force uh, proposals. Because like everyone knows what the farmer is getting for the beef, more or less your 375 and 385 of a base price today. And people know what the consumer is paying at the other end. But there's no one really knows. And, and I suppose, Michelle, you, you raised it there uh, it's when you said about the 45%. Um, you know, it's very difficult to know what happens between the processor and the retailer. And there's a lack of information and a lack of knowledge there. So that transparency uh, area, hopefully, what's passed uh, in, in, this, in those proposals at European level will give us more room there. Um, working our way back, and, and again, there was, I suppose, there was a lot of observations, a lot of statements. Uh, and maybe a fair bit of repetition between the people, but I think overall people felt that the report, and that's what we came in to discuss, that the report was a very good and worthwhile report, and uh, Professor Hennessy did a very good job on it. So um, just back in, in relation, and um, um, Rose is, is out at the moment, but the, the, 
capping issue is uh, an issue that has been put into proposals by the Commissioner. It's not one that has been put in by IFA. It's one that has been put in by the, the Commission, uh, and there are a few figures uh, mentioned there. In relation to ANC, um, we ran a series of meetings in the build-up to the review around the country on ANC, and I suppose we had a number of priorities, but chief among them was that the ANC payments would reflect the natural handicap of any given area. And, uh, you know, we, we lobbied um, long and hard, and we lobbied all of you individually. Uh, and speaking of lobbying, I suppose I should have started off and thanked this committee for your support in our Sukhra Cow um, uh, lobby. It was a, our priority in the budget, pre-budget submission. Um, we got good support from this committee, and many of you highlighted and, and kept it going as well. Obviously, we didn't get all we wanted, but it was a start. But on the ANC, we lobbied uh, to get the payments back to at least 2008 levels, and between last year uh, the second last budget and this budget, they are there. They need to be increased further. The ANC report has been done, review has been done, the proposals are there. Uh, 4,000 areas have been included extra, and 1,300 have lost out. Uh, at the moment, we're in a series of <coughs> meetings explaining that to farmers around the country. We had the first two last week in Atai and uh, Cavan. Um, and they, uh, she also raised the issue of the AEOS, and I suppose that has been more or less replaced by the GLOSS, and we're lobbying very hard, uh, we've said it long and often, that uh, the GLOSS to be opened again. It's fully subscribed by farmers. Farmers have shown their interest to be involved in it for a number of reasons, and I suppose, again, it comes back to uh, another question that was raised um, in relation to the importance of the direct payments. And look, um, it wasn't GLOSS that was mentioned. Uh, it was the BDGP that one of the lads down here mentioned, I think. But all those direct payments, they're absolutely of importance. Any cut to them is more than 100% of the cut to profits on farmers because direct payments make up 113% um, of the average farm income on sheep farms and 115% on cattle rearing farms. So, like, they're. That, that states the, says enough about the importance of them there. Um, uh, we, we, I was in at our own forestry meeting, Willie, you brought up the forestry, and I think there's a lot more that government can do there. We have highlighted the, like we're way below the target of forestry planting in the country. I think 7,000 hectares was the target, and we just barely broke 5,000 hectares. So uh, that shows that there's not enough being done there to help farmers um, because, you know, if you haven't farmers planting the forestry, you won't get that level of forestry that you, that you need. Uh, there's 185,000 hectares of unenclosed land that we feel can be planted, uh, but for some reason it's not allowed to be planted at the moment. And also that forestry premium needs to go back uh, and very much favour the farmer planting the land rather than the investment funds and the likes. Um, and we have put that to the Minister and the Department on a number of occasions. Um, you know, and hopefully uh, the penny will drop uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, you know, when you talk about the suckler cow herd, uh, and some people might say, well, why have it if, if, you know, if it's not making a profit and farmers are voting with their feet and they're getting out? But there's the whole area of the public goods, the maintenance of the environment. Uh, you know, there were figures even this morning on tourism, and I don't have them to hand now, but they were very, very positive anyways. I think it was at 11.6 million tourists we had to the country last year. And, um, you know, a huge uh, spin-off from that. A lot of that tourism is built on the back of farmers maintaining the rural countryside. Um, you know, they wouldn't be too anxious to come and look at an overgrown countryside. So there's those public goods. There's also the three billion, almost three billion uh, beef sector uh, and, you know, the spin-off of that to the rural areas. Two or three of the figures that Tia has highlighted, and, you know, it has been mentioned here and you've rightly taken up on it, uh, Charlie, I think it was you that said that in Donegal it had dropped from 45,000 cows to 39,000 suckler cows. Um, Tia's report 
stated, and that's what, that's give or take 12 per cent, I'd say, that drop off. TU's report stated that for every 10 per cent drop in suckler cow numbers, it was a loss of 145 million to the beef sector and a loss of 305 million in total output to the wider economy. So again, highlighting the importance that, you know, you can't just take suckler cow as what maybe it's not making a profit on the farm. There's a whole uh, heap of further links to the chain. Um, the taxpayers, taxpayers will inevitably cop on and stop paying it. I, I, I think in relation to the taxpayers, first of all, whether it's cap or whether it's beef price, they're, they're, getting, a, they're getting a good deal for their money. <coughs> if you go back, you know, maybe 50 years ago, the, there was 30% of the average household income being spent on food. Today, just because the farmer isn't getting paid as much as he should, he or she should be getting paid, there's only 10 to 12% of household income being spent on food. Even on the consultation, in the consultation process, uh, you know, that the Commission put out to the public right across Europe in the build-up to the CAP proposals, uh, and it would be interesting for the members of the committee to, to get those figures because they were very positive in relation to the non-farmers' view of, you know, the farmers being subsidised to supply an adequate amount of top quality, safe and healthy food at affordable prices. And when that was put to the taxpayers, like the, the stats were a clear, clear majority in favour of the cap to be adequately funded to pay the farmers to continue to supply uh, safe, healthy food at, at, uh, at affordable levels. So, you know, that was, it was encouraging, you know, when we went through it at a, at a COPA meeting in Brussels. Um, so, and I suppose a number of times the question came in relation to the factories are going to gobble up uh, this money, whether it's the 40 euro or whether it's 200 euro. And that was definitely mentioned and Angus, uh, you know, would have discussed all of those issues uh, at length in the, in the Livestock Committee and Kevin. Um, but the feeling is, you know, and even my own personal feeling is the further you can keep it away. Look, the suckler cow farmer needs support. Absolutely, everyone agrees with that. It's very difficult to get the absolute ideal way that you can guarantee that the factories won't gobble it up. But the feeling was that the further away you could keep it from the finished animal, the better chance you had of more of it staying with the farmer. I'm not saying uh, that it's going to work out that way, uh, but you know, at least there was, and there was something there to work off already. Um, I suppose one of the other things that has been mentioned a few times is in relation to pitch and farmer against farmer. We are absolutely, uh, I won't say the one organisation, but we're an organisation that always tries to avoid that. We represent all sectors of farming and it's crucial and I agree with you totally, Jackie, when you say that this isn't about putting one sector against the other. It absolutely isn't. Um, because there's a lot of interdependence bet between the sectors and you will never see IFA trying to pitch one sector against, uh, against the other. So, um, and the importance of the live exports, and Jackie, you rightly pointed to 40,000 kill and over it. I think last week with a kill of 38,500 was only two out of the last six weeks that we came under 40,000. And again, you rightly said about the 30,000. It's often uh, I put in my report down through the years that, um, um, you know, it, it's just hard to get a price increase. And I remember looking at it at one stage uh, and like the factories have said in the past and they've said that they could manage those kills, but it's difficult and we don't often see a price increase when, when the kill is high, um, whether the factories say they can manage it or not. Um, but, you know, and we might accept that the markets are quite tough now, but in the August-September period when the beef price was rising in the UK and the markets were good for our beef, uh, all we saw here at the time were the factories cutting the beef price by the equivalent of €100 Euros a head, which was very, very difficult to take. And... Um, you know, we, we met with the factories and highlighted that to them. We also had 
the case of the live exports and we've met with the minister uh, and we've met with the department in relation to highlighting the, the, the very, very important role that live exports have to play and particularly this coming spring where we need to get as many of the dairy bred calves out of the country as possible. Um, but we did have, I suppose, with one of the best markets we had there for a couple of years in Turkey. Um, and, you know, we saw the uncertainty there and the, the exchange rate go all over the place. I think two years ago, the Wainland that cost a thousand euros here cost the Turkish farmer direct was 3,200 lira. The following year, it was four and a half thousand lira. And at one stage this year, it was seven and a half thousand lira. So to get the same value uh, of Wainland, they needed nearly to get the, the thousand euro Wainland that they paid two years ago for between four and five hundred now. So that was really that market out of the equation. So um, and, and another issue was the climate change that was highlighted. And look, we were in here last week on the climate change and uh, I think it's very important that we all have uh, recognised that we have a huge role to play there. Um, it's, it's a key sector. I talk about it at every IFA meeting, but I say that it's, it's a challenge that we can embrace as Irish farmers. Climate change is a global issue. It's not just an Irish issue. Um, we need to produce our commodity and our product as carbon efficiently as possible. We need to invoke the Chagask report and research and genetics and science to try and do it as efficiently as possible and always aim to constantly improve. I think Farmers has done that. That's how we're producing 40 per cent more now than we were in 1990, uh, while only producing the same amount of carbon. Uh, what we found in the smart farming um, programme is that there are further uh, improvements that we can make there that can have a win-win. We can reduce our carbon emissions and also re uh, reduce our costs on the farm. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, Chagas has set out a roadmap and they've highlighted three areas in relation to land use, uh, agricultural use and renewables. And we've called on the, on the government. Um, we talked about the farm forestry already. Uh, with, uh, I think anaer uh, the anaerobic digesters and the solar are two key areas. But for those to happen, and I think farmers have had a false dawn with false hopes in relation to willow and miscanthus. Um, I think, you know, in relation to the other areas, we need the Taoiseach and the government to lead the way. In relation to feeding tariffs, uh, access to the grid, and the development of regional biomass trade and logistics centres. So, you know, there are areas there that we can, um, you know, drive on, uh, but we need government support there as well. So I'll hand over to Angus or Kevin or Damien if there are other areas that they want to come in on there. <coughs> yeah, I'll come in on that there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 just the questions, stroke comments that are coming from, from around the room here do very much reflect a lot of the, the the questions and comments that I would get from, from my members at, as I'm going around the country doing the meetings on, on a weekly basis and even on a nightly basis. So they're, they're, they're well-known concerns uh, and, and are, they're well-voiced. Uh, uh, we, we're here today because of the report that we got commissioned. We felt it was very important that, you know, these questions are out there, they're being asked. It was very important that we got some kind of structure in place and we, we we went and we, we hired probably the, the best person we thought that could put that report together and deliver it, and she did an excellent job on it. I think certainly anyone I, I have spoken to that has read it and read it in full would be in agreement on that. Um, there's a broad range of, uh, of questions and issues that continually keep coming up. The dairy conversion is, is, is something that comes up on a regular basis, and, and it was pointed out again in here, you know, not all farms are suitable for, for dairy conversion, farm type, farm land, farm structures. They're all different. And, uh, you know, I would argue, you know, that a lot of our, our suckler sector is operating on some of the tougher land. Uh, and in, in terms of that, they do a fantastic job. They're converting, you know, they're converting grass into human edible protein on tough land, which is not suitable for tillage. It's not suitable for dairy. They're doing a, an excellent job on it. And, uh, you know, if, if they, it's often said our dairy industry is, is, is ranked number one and our beef industry is ranked number five in terms of 
climate change and that, you know, but our, our beef industry is operating on the tougher land, you know, I think they're, they're pretty good at what they do anyway, but we are seeing, and, and uh, Deputy Prenrose spoke about the BDGP, you know, we are seeing uh, figures, the ICBF being able to put greenhouse gas figures, climate change figures on it, you know, you're able to make the argument, we're getting stronger and stronger in a position from a beef sector to be able to make those strong, coherent arguments and to be able to defend our position on that. Um, so climate change, yes, obviously is going to be a key issue going forward. The promotion of the, the, the quality suckler herd, um, that's key and, and, and we, we have put significant effort into that um, and we believe that there, there is room to make, a, to make progress in that space. It's, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but we do believe there is room in there to make a bit of progress on it. And certainly, we would feel strongly that uh, you know, farmers that are, are producing those quality suckler bred animals do deserve uh, to be rewarded correctly for it. The meat industry has openly, on numerous occasions, said, you know, part of our key branding image is based around green quality suckler herds. When you walk into a meat processing facility and look at the photograph or the painting or the picture behind the, the desk on the wall, it'll be a quality suckler herd or it'll be the progeny from the suckler herd which is being used to, to promote Irish beef. And that's a positive, but we would like to see the guys being rewarded for that. So it's something, it is something we're we're, we're certainly working on at the moment, and there is room to improve in it. Um, the question comes up, uh, I suppose there's a couple, a couple of key things here, right? First of all, you know, the, the factories taking the 200 euros. Again, um, one of the key things, and we look, we had a problem, we had an issue here last week as well, too, in relation to factories found illegally trimming carcasses, you know, one of the key problems in this sector is, is a lack of transparency, you know, and lack of transparency builds a, a, a lack of trust between the parties involved. If there's no transparency, there's no trust. And, uh, you know, when it comes to transparency, we haven't been found wanting, you know, we, during uh, previous takeovers of meat factories and that, we, we put a lot of time and a lot of effort into getting reports commissioned on the structures within the beef industry and how it works and that. So, you know, we, we have been playing our part in trying to, to increase that transparency in there. Certainly, I do feel actually it's a, it's a real good area where someone like the Oireachtas Committee here on Agriculture could get involved in. Senator Mulhern referenced a report there earlier from Iowa University, you know, about uh, the percentage the farmers were, were getting uh, on that report, I think you said 43 or 45 percent. Yeah. Price. It was identified with Irish farmers only getting half that. Yeah. So, I mean, I certainly feel, you know, someone like the Oireachtas Committee here, that is a real good place that you can make a real positive step forward in terms of transparency. Get root down, get the figures. What is happening in, in that space? And, you know, politically, it would be a good thing to do. And uh, I certainly feel that that is a, a real strong area that, that, you know, politicians can make a real difference. The minister, the minister says he can't do anything on price, but transparency is, is something I think politicians have a real good role to play in. And, and I, I certainly feel that, that uh, it's something that could, could be worked on. Um, you know, and in terms of, again, <coughs> you know, protecting that money, uh, the president is right. We, we were of the opinion that the closer it, it is to the primary producer, to the, to the, to the farmer producing the, the calf, the better, uh, or the weanling. Um, but live exports play a key role in it as well too, in driving competition in the marketplace. The, the factories will have less ability to, to manoeuvre the price if there is strong live exports in it. And again, that's, a, that's an area where we believe there is certainly a significant amount of room to improve on. Um, PO's got to mention here as well too. We have been very clear. We are uh, we are licensed or registered uh, to uh, facilitate producer organisations, and we have been saying quite clearly that if any group of farmers want assistance in that, that we will help them out in that space. Um, and uh, 
you know, again, we're more than willing to work with anyone, anyone who wants to uh, talk to us about that. Just, I think, it does get spoken about in terms of, of consumers, and we, we have to f remember that we are an exporting country as well too, so the European marketplace is absolutely key to us. Almost 80 to 90 percent of what we produce is being sold on continental European markets. So, you know, we have to talk about not just the Irish consumer, but the European consumer and what the European consumer wants and what the European consumer is willing to pay for. And they're quite often, they're quite often uh, different messages. You know, in general, the European consumer will tell us they want the highest of standards, the highest of welfare, they want the highest of everything. But then, you know, when it comes to our trade policy in Europe, we have a cap policy which is telling us we need to, to do more, far less, improve water quality, environmental, improve everything, and yet we have a trade policy coming from Europe which is saying we're going to do, we're going to do free trade agreements all over the place, we're probably going to offer up beef as part of it, and, you know, should let the beef farmers figure it out themselves. I mean, this is why payments and payments to the beef farmers and the beef sector have always been critically important. If you go back and if you look back historically, the beef sector has always had strong payments. Be it in, in previous reforms, be it through the, the suckler cow payment, through the 10 month, the 22 month, the slaughter premiums, the extensification premiums, there has always been a strong support for the beef sector in Europe. Go back even earlier than that, and you're, you're into, you know, intervention, uh, aids to private storage, export, uh, export credits. You know, you're into a whole range, but the, though they were actually built into the price at the time. So there always has been, and this is why we feel, we feel, with the change in in in, in the way it has been structured, targeted supports for the beef sector are the way forward, and it is the key. Uh, and and um, Jackie down here and someone else referenced putting farmer against farmer. We have deliberately chosen not to do that, which is why we've token, talked about targeted payments as opposed to coupled payments. There was a drive to push for coupled payments uh, by, by various people in the media. We were always on targeted payments. We believe that um, you need to reward farmers for, for, for doing the work, for, for keeping the animals, for, for farming in an environmentally friendly farmer uh, fashion, and that's why targeted payments are absolutely critical going forward for us. It is the suckler sector and the sheep sector, but the suckler sector specifically today is designated a sensitive sector in Europe. So, I mean, if we're going to designate it as a sensitive sector and we're going to have a trade policy which give, is giving away our European meat market, we have to find a way around it. Because if it's sensitive, we have to support it. This is why we're saying targeted payments, absolutely critical going forward. And uh, look, I suppose there's a whole range of other, other issues that, that I, I, I'm more than willing to talk about people. Yeah, sure, with. It just strikes me, and, and, and Mr. Woods has set out, he's, he's sort of addressed it comprehensively, addressed issues comprehensively, with the exception of the, the fact that, you know, your voice and your participation is not there at a big oh, forum. Yeah, before, yeah. And surely you are a key stakeholder here, and there are complexities around pricing, and there are, uh, there are obstacles as regards the powers of a minister mm. to intervene in relation to pricing, and surely the place for this to be discussed is at the table, with the stakeholders, where you're well able to advocate for yeah. farmers, yeah. And, and, and that's not happening. And, and in, fa in fairness, we, IFA, uh, uh, I wasn't present at the time, but IFA were the group that lobbied and pushed the hardest for, for the formulation and the setting up of the B Forum to get the key industry representatives around the table, everyone uh, discussing the key problems within the sector. That was the intention. We have attended 12 of the 13 or 11 of the 12 meetings, so we have only missed one of those meetings, which was the last one, which we, we chose not to attend. 
for obvious reasons. We are, after suffering a long and hard year in the beef sector, in farming sector, but it, specifically in beef, we, we've had everything from rain, snow, drought, everything. And we wanted, we wanted key issues. We wanted key issues put on the agenda for the beef forum relating to price, relating to the suckler cow, relating to uh, Brexit and where we go going forward. We wanted key issues put on the agenda. And if the if the minister wasn't willing to put key issues onto the agenda, we felt we had to highlight those issues outside the door. We would have preferred to be inside where we had been for all bar that particular meeting, we would have preferred to have been inside. But if they're not going to address key farm interests, it's not debt by PowerPoint but do every not, meeting. But do not accept that in the budget, and it was acknowledged by your president, that there are so, so many sectors that were looking for additional funds in the budget. And he did, I, I'm not saying it's, the, it's, a, it's an answer to the prayers of, of farmers, but there is a recognition of the very difficult place that suckler farmers are in, yeah. and that was reflected in the budget. And your, that meeting that G pulled out of was in advance of the budget meeting. Where do you stand now in relation to engaging on these issues? Well, I, I, uh, it, it, if it, you, it, Michelle, yeah. it, it, for, Senator Michel uh, Mulhern, I, I referenced that in, unfortunately you weren't here, but I referenced the 40 euros in what I said before we opened up for questioning here this afternoon. So uh, maybe, I might, do you want me to go back over? Yeah, it's a specific yeah. question where you stand now where in we relation stand on to this engagement. You, you yourself have recognised the value of it. Surely it's more important now than ever. You know, and you don't always get, as you know yourselves, you don't go to always get everything your own way, but there has been a significant recognition by the Minister, and we're here pushing for more, yeah, but we want Kevin, you to engage. Kevin Kinsler wants to come in. Kevin to come in, but you know, oh, yeah. for, for, I know that I would have found uh, a number of the meetings that I was at nothing more than talking shops, um, you know, and hopefully that there is the possibility for it to improve and get something done. By the time, uh, and Angus referenced it, it was death by PowerPoint presentation, go around the room and then out the door. Nothing to achieve. Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. And, and maybe just to address the, the first question that, that uh, Michelle uh, raised, Michelle, the, 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 our Deputy Mulhern, uh, the, the first thing we should say is that every time we raise cattle prices with the factories at the Beef Forum, and I've been at every one of them except the last one, the Minister pulls up his hand and says, Stop, you can't raise that issue. We're not going to, I'm not going to allow you to discuss that here. I cannot discuss cattle prices. Now, we don't accept that and we try to continue talking, we try to engage with them, but that has been the response of the Minister at the Beef Forum. So you need to understand that, that that's part of the frustration that both our President and Livestock Chairman uh, uh, had to endure in that context for meeting after meeting after meeting. The second thing is to say is that, um, yes, we did take very strong action prior to the last uh, um, uh, Beef Forum, and, and thankfully, you know, we got a response uh, with the help of this committee, with your help, with the help of the chairman, with the help of other members of this committee. The minister, the pressure came on so heavy, he had to respond. And he did put 20 million on, uh, on an additional 40 euros on Suckler. So that was positive, and we take that as positive. But like, it happened because we put on a lot of pressure, and we ran a very strong campaign. And as part of that campaign, the president took a decision to pull out of the beef forum. So, it did work uh, in terms of getting extra money for the sector uh, farmers. So bear that in mind. But Chairman, in, in a broader context, and I just want to make two or three points in relation to, to today's uh, uh, proceedings in committee. I think that the first one to say is that, look, at, we very much welcome the support of this committee uh, for sucklers, the support of this committee for the, the report that uh, Professor Tia Hennessy put together. And I think listening to everybody today, uh, everybody complimented the work that, that uh, Professor Hennessy done there. And we welcome that because that's a clear message to Irish farmers and Irish agriculture that there is broad consensus across the houses of the Oireachtas in support of the suckler cow herd in this country. And that's a very strong IFA policy, and it's a very strong statement from this committee and this House. And we take it in the positive, and, and we welcome that strongly. The second thing is to say that uh, I think everybody who spoke here today said in, in uh, some form that the suckler herd needs increased support. We have a very clear policy. We want to get an additional 200 euros per cow into the sector. 
I didn't hear anybody today speak against that, and we take that as a positive. We take that in general, people are supporting that, and we know some people have been very strong, very out front in supporting that, and we welcome that, and we, we, we see that as a very positive development across the Oireachtas and across this committee here, Chairman. Uh, the, the other point is that I suppose very strong sentiment from this committee here about the important role of sucklers, both in terms of the Irish beef sector, in terms of our exports, but maybe more importantly of all, in terms of, of farmers, your constituents, the people that you represent, the society that we have down there, it, it keeps it together. And I think that the one critical issue that Tia Hennessy pulled out of her report was she highlighted that very much, the role that sucklers and suckler farming and suckler farmers play in their local economy, and, and, and Deputy Kinney highlighted that very clearly in relation to the likes of what happens in Leitrim in that regard, and the Marts, and the same in Donegal, and the same in Westmead. Every county that we went to today, same story, the very positive role of sucklers. And it's important that we put that on the record of this committee here today, and we put it on the record of this House in terms of, of the support for that. And the next question then, because there was a lot of questions around, well, what can we do about that, or how does this work, and where do the factories fit into all that? And, and let's try and be clear about that. I mean, your role here is as legislators. That's, that's what, what, what you do in this House. And how can you help that then? Well, the first thing we need to do, and we're very clear on this, is we're saying very clearly we want increased and greater government support for the sector. sector. You want the same. We have a proposal that we want to increase the level of direct payments up to 200 euros a cow. We need more national resources and more national funding in that regard. And as legislators, you have a key role to play in that regard. And in fairness, you played that strongly. You played that card strongly in the lead up to the last budget. You're going to have to do it again going forward in terms of uh, future schemes, future budgets, future cap reforms in that regard. Uh, the second thing is, uh, that we have advocated to try and get additional uh, payments for uh, quality beef and quali a, a quality payment around suckler beef. You have a role to play in that regard as well as legislators in trying to push that along both with the processors, with Board Bia, with the Minister, with the Department of Agriculture and supporting the case that we're making in that regard. And the third case then in terms of trying to deal with this issue around the factories most of that comes back to competition or a lack of competition in that area and you have a key role as legislators in that regard and dare i say the most immediate and first point that you can do in that regard is strongly strongly support the live export trade and the deputy cahill and others raised that so we would ask you to help us in that regard to support us strongly in terms of advocating for the live export trade, trying to maximise the number of animals that we get out on the live export trade, and we have a big challenge facing us on calf exports and the increase in the dairy herd uh, this spring, and we'd ask you to help us in that regard and, and, and uh, continue to push that and, and try and get the, the best positive result in that regard. And finally, then, and, and um, my colleague Angus Woods uh, went into this in detail, in terms of the cap reform and in terms of the international trade agreements. You have a huge role as legislators in both of those issues in terms of increasing the level of direct payments to sucklers in cap, uh, in terms of making sure that the direct payments to livestock farmers continue strongly, and of course in the international trade agreements like Mercosur and Brazil in that regard. So, Chairman, we take a lot of positive out of this committee here today, the support for the suckler heck sector, the strong, I think, unequivocal support for the campaign to increase direct payments to 200 euros per cow from this committee. So we're very positive on that, and we want to thank you in that regard. Deputy Kenny, yep. One, one if you like, related matter in regard to that. The 40 euro per cow, which was what was delivered in the budget, was uh, a payment for an action. Correct. That's, that's, and and yep. in regard to that, the the... the the 200 euro, which we're now, if you like, 160 euro short of, if you want to put it that way, right? Are you satisfied that that 160 euro will have to be linked to a payment to, to some action? Is that, is that, is that, you know, do you see, the Minister and everyone comes back to us in regard to all of this, that there's issues here in regard to doing, giving money to a farmer or giving money to a sector, that you have, you have a whole range of issues in regard to, um, state aid and all of this sort of thing coming into play. 
So okay. do, do you accept that there will have to be actions around all that? Are you satisfied with that? Where, where are you going? Because this thing of saying, you know, we want 200 euro per cow is, is all fine. You know, it's, it's a lovely tagline. But we need to get into the detail of it to find out exactly how it's going to be delivered and how it's going to be delivered that it's, that it's achievable and not just a tagline. On that point, would it be fair to say now at this stage and where we are with the top of climate change and all that, the issues that go on that, that it's probably impossible to see a payment just 200 euro without having to do some actions uh, going forward? Uh, and would it be also true to say that, that uh, well, uh, the points that you made, I think you've summarised, uh, Kevin, quite well, the whole purpose of the meeting and what has been discussed here, uh, would also be true to say that in, in the context of where we are now when it's 2018 almost complete, that the big discussion about where we're going to be is going to be going to have to do with the cap and reform going in that regard. And the difficult balancing act there will be, first of all, is obviously the budget that is going to be discussed, obviously, in, in the early in new year from the European point of view. And the difficult balancing act then, following on from that, in the event that there's an agreement on budget is, uh, in order to ensure that one sector gets more or gets, because of the difficult situation they, be, they may be in or are in, that will have to be taken from another sector. Okay. Can, can, can I, I suppose just, just to deal with that, both I think what Deputy Kennedy said, uh, Kenny said and yourself, uh, Chairman, I suppose the first issue we should say is that, you know, from an IFA perspective, we've never been, uh, we've never said that, you know, we want 200 euros a cow and suckler farmers won't do anything to, uh, for that money. We've never said that anywhere, right? So let's be clear here. There are certain conditions that come with direct payments. We have always advocated in here in terms of a cross-compliance, a good uh, farming and um, agricultural conditions. We always meet those, and farmers are prepared to meet those. Um, of course, there are other issues that farmers, ha as Deputy Kennedy says, in the current uh, 40 euros per cow scheme, the new um, uh, pilot scheme that the Minister introduced this year, there's a requirement in terms of weighing the animals, in terms of weighing the cows and calves. And, I mean, we've met the department on this, and Angus covered this. We want to uh, keep the work there to a minimum, but we've, we didn't go into the department and said, we want the 40 euros and we're not going to do anything. We haven't done that from, from an IFA perspective. But I want to clarify the issue just around the payment and the cap and the national resources, because I think that's important. The first thing is, and we should clarify this very clearly, Chairman, because there has been a lot of misinformation around this, the IFA have never suggested that we take one penny from any other farmer to make an additional payment to suckler cow premiums. The Minister, others have, keep asking, well, where are you going to get the money, who are you going to take it off of this type of thing. We've never suggested at any stage we should take one penny from any other farmer in that regard. That's why we have suggested two things. One is we need additional national resources to make additional payments to suckler cows. And the second thing, in the context of CAP, we have been clear all along, we have been saying that any targeted payments for suckler cows should come from CAP Pillar 2 schemes. And CAP Pillar 2 schemes don't involve having any negative impact on the basic payment to farmers. And we've been crystal clear on that. Some people have tried to confuse it. Some people have suggested that uh, we're trying to take payments off of other farmers. We haven't. And we want to nail that very strongly on the head today, that, that, that that's not the case. So we're talking about targeted Pillar 2 payments under a targeted scheme to suckler farmers. And under that, there are two methods of funding. There's CAP Pillar 2 funding, and there's also additional national resources. And the final point I want to make is because, again, there's confusion brought forward into this when people don't want to do certain things. Uh, we have discussed this at the highest level in the EU Commission, and they have explained to us that the only thing that we're short of in, time, in terms of trying to make uh, an additional payment of 200 euros to suckler cows is resources. So if we can get the resources, and if this committee backs the resources, which I understand you are, and you're back in the campaign to try and get 200 euros for, per suckler cow, uh, that's a great help in terms of trying to bring additional national resources to try and finance that. So it's a combination of national resources and also CAP Pillar 2 funding going forward. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes. Any other member want to come in for it before I bring in uh, Damien MacDonald? Okay, Damien. No, I just want to make uh, two final points. Um, w one is uh, just in relation to the CAP. Um, I think there's a real concern that, I mean, we, we, we put everything off until the next CAP 
and I think there's increasing concerns looking at some of the decisions in Brussels this week that the cap could be delayed as well. So I, I think the, the issue of the decline in the sucker cow numbers and what's happening is an urgent issue that needs to be addressed. And, and the, in this year's budget, and we would acknowledge it, there was new money invested in sucker cows in the form of the 20 million, and the ANCs was a help as well. So I think it's important to, to mention that. But just to conclude, because I think just to, to, to it would be remiss of us maybe to, just to, to finish and talk about the future. And the clear and present danger that's posed for this sector, sector for Brexit and where we, where we sit at this point in time. And I think, you know, as an association, we have to put it on the record here that if we end up in a scenario where we have a no-deal Brexit, the beef sector is probably the most vulnerable sector, I'd say, in Europe, the Irish beef sector, what's going to happen. Because as well as having difficulties getting our product into the UK, if that product goes back onto the European market where 45% of our beef already goes, it will cause huge problems <coughs> in the price of beef there as well. So I think it's important uh, to, to make the point that um, as part of the contingency planning uh, for a no-deal Brexit, the beef sector has to be right up at the top of that in terms of what the government and at, at European level, what contingency plans are in place uh, to, to put a floor under the price of beef or to put protection measures in place uh, to save our members from what's going to happen to them. Already, as a result of the, the, the issues with sterling, there's, there's pressure on the system in terms of price. And there's no doubt about it that the uncertainty around the corner um, in, uh, with, with Brexit opposing, uh, you know, coming along on the 29th of March is not helping confidence in the whole sector. And I just think we need to put that on, on the record to the committee this evening when we're talking about an issue like this of just that elephant uh, that's coming. That it's not in the room yet, but it's coming straight at us. Um, and we'd be coming, uh, any citizen or any farmer or anybody interested in the sector has got to be increasingly worried when we see the way things are playing out at the moment. On that point, with regards to the elephant in the room, the Brexit elephant, we will be tomorrow publishing our uh, updated report on Brexit and the implications of the agriculture sector, and that issue in general will be dealt with in fair detail. So, you know, we're trying to keep ahead of, I won't say ahead of the policy, it's very hard to keep ahead of that policy, but we're trying to be up to date with it anyway, so that's an issue we'll be addressing tomorrow. So, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank uh, the, the members of the IFA, uh, Mr. Joe Healy, Kevin Kinsley, Angus Woods, and Damien MacDonald for coming before us today and having a good uh, open discussion, is, is, which is a very important issue. Uh, thank the members. Uh, this is, as there's no further business there today, is the last meeting we have before Christmas. I'd like to wish everybody a very happy, peaceful Christmas, and there's no doubt we'll engage again in the new year. Uh, hopefully, that we won't be convened or reconvened for some storm or weather event between now and <laughs> now and the 15th of, of January when we are due to. Yeah, I'd also like to thank uh, the broadcasting staff here beside behind us who are uh, here on a regular basis. Uh, uh, the debates office, uh, the secretariat, uh, Josie here beside me, Hubert, uh, Jack, who has gone to put the final touches to our Brexit report, uh, and everybody else has been involved with the committee uh, for the past uh, year. It's been a busy year. I think in the past year we had, I think we had 36 meetings. Uh, we published a number of different reports. Uh, we've been engaging, as you know, in Brussels, uh, Croatia, and the next year will obviously be as busy. Uh, CAP, apart from Brexit, I, suppose, I think CAP will be the main focus of our attention in the coming year, which is a huge issue. Uh, and as huge, as we mentioned here briefly, huge uh, challenges in that regard that we all have to work together on. I think that's the only way we can achieve a positive outcome for the agriculture sector in Ireland. So, no further business, the meeting stands adjourned until January the 15th at 3.30. Sorry. Before you finish, I wanted to record as well our thanks to yourself and Josie and indeed all the committee and the staff here. Uh, I know we weren't at all 36 meetings, but we, we were at a fair few of them. And uh, uh, again, I'd like to, I'd like to, re <laughs> to reiterate our, you know, our, our gratitude and our appreciation um, for your constant support within this room and outside the room as well. So just want that on the record. And I wish you all a very happy Christmas and that we'll be at most of the 36 in the new year. Thank you very much. Now for a bit, the meeting stands adjourned until January the 15th at 3.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you.